Yeah, so putting together a talk for this crowd, the Center for Evolutionary Medicine definitely has taken me outside of my, come on through, standard comfort zone. There are seats there. Um, my standard comfort zone in terms of my own research, because I would usually introduce myself for a seminar saying, well, I'm an ecologist and I work on communities and how global change affects the composition and aggregate properties of communities like productivity or diversity, right? But, but if I translate that work into terms of disease, I would say, well, I'm, I'm a disease ecologist um, and I work on the effects of host nutrition and how host nutrition then alters within host processes and leads to changes in aggregate properties like epidemiological properties of systems. So infection prevalence, for example, or transmission through a community. So with that lens on, I would say that I have some things to say to this group that I hope will be new and um, they're underlain by evolution but I won't talk as much about evolution <coughs> explicitly um, today. I'll talk more about the environment and the nutritional environment of hosts. So with that said, I also need to tell you that last Friday, um, one of my graduate students who's been doing a really cool project looking at titer, so number of virions in a host, sent me data that caused me to take a really deep breath and rethink pretty much this entire talk and about the last eight years of my research. So it's really exciting, but I guess I would also say that um, my talk today is more of a starting point for me in thinking um, rather than a story that I thought was all wrapped up in a bow. So um, with that said, I will start here, which is where we often start in medical settings. We have a host and a pathogen that we're really interested in. In ecology as well, we often start at this point. So mathematical models of disease generally start with a pathogen and its host, and we track infection through a population, for example, as a population process. But I would say, coming into disease ecology, my lens is as a community ecologist, I'm interested in species interactions and how the environment modifies interactions. And so when I look at this, I think, well, it's missing something like that. <laughs> So I would redraw the diagram as a much more complex set of interactions, not simply a host, but a host and pathogen and the context in which they're nested. So to walk you through this, I would start with the host, right, in the center here, because that's often where we start in medical settings as well as in ecological settings. We're interested in the host. But hosts aren't just hosts, right? There's genetic differences among hosts. There's species level differences and variation among hosts. So many species, for example, could be susceptible to the same pathogen. There can also be variability among hosts uh, that can arise in many different ways. All right, then we've got the vector up here. Sometimes it's not just one vector. Sometimes many vector species will carry the same pathogen. And sometimes a single vector species will carry multiple pathogens with implications for infection or co-infection within a host. But this is a much larger context than we often consider. Vectors can also have preferences among hosts, so they may preferentially, for example, feed on an uninfected host, which has obvious implications for increasing infection in a population. Okay, then there's the pathogen that's being carried by this vector. There can be multiple interacting strains within a host. There could be whole species of different pathogens, so whole clades that are different. We could have, for example, uh, viral and bacterial pathogens infecting the same host, and in some cases, the same host cell. So there are species interactions that can take place within that host cell context, but also at the scale of the host with upregulating or downregulating various defense pathways in the host. All right, consumers, maybe a little far from the medical context, but still very important. As soon as you step outside of humans, if you think about consumers, so for example, lions having preferences among infected or uninfected 
uh, sorry, between infected or uninfected hosts. Uh, if, if lions prefer to consume or are more able to consume that infected host, then you could imagine that infection would decline or be maintained at low levels, whereas if they prefer healthy hosts, maybe they share a pathogen and they're, they have aversions to attacking a host with that shared pathogen, there may be an increase in the pathogen through that interaction. Okay, but then there's environment or nutrition. And that's where I'll probably I'll focus my, uh, most of my energy today. Uh, but resources can affect host quality or host quantity. The number of hosts in a community can be affected by resources. And I'll, I'll talk about this more in a minute. So I want to map this on as a diagram. So here's my analogy for the, the human diseases. All right, a grass, right? You have to sort of think hard about whether you'll accept whether my grass is a model system. So I'm going to just draw this out. Here's my grass, and here's your human. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of similarities here. So for example, within my diagram, we've got those vectors, right? Arthropods long feeding proboscis or whatever it's called in your particular arthropod. It feeds on stuff that flows through the host, whether it is phloem or blood or whatever it may be in that host, right? Very similar. My diagrams make them even more similar. <laughs> then there are viruses. Viruses, they're all, uh, you know, pretty similar, right? They have a very similar uh, life, lifestyle, right? They infect a host cell. They take over the cellular, uh, the ribosomes of the host, for example. They replicate on those, right? And that is true in a grass. It's true in a cow, and it's true in a human, right? So across lots of different taxa, we see viruses acting quite similar once they're in a cell of a host. Okay, so maybe we don't have to worry so much about lions currently. That's not a big effect for humans, and so maybe you have to sort of, you know, leave this piece of my diagram out. But it's, as soon as we move outside of uh, humans, then these consumers become important. All right, but this nutrition thing, like what is a grass's nutrition, right? It's not like my lunch here. So, when I say the word nutrition, even in my own family, this is what people think of, and probably in this setting as well, right? Some balanced diet, we've got our food pyramid, or whatever it is that you think of, you think about food. This is what we take in. But these are all organisms, and we're all made of nutrients. Okay, so to make that pile of vegetables, I dump this bag of fertilizer on. Okay, so there's this link of nutrition. And in fact, if you take any one organism and you separate it into its own piles of each element, then it looks sort of like this. This is a diagram from uh, Wikipedia, and this is my own little attempt at showing the similarities with uh, humans. So this is a grass, happens to be corn. Uh, and we have, you know, a whole lot of oxygen, quite a bit of carbon, uh, quite a bit of hydrogen, some nitrogen, and then there's some other stuff, right? Here's the others, potassium and other stuff, right? All of the micronutrients that are in organisms. So at this level, hosts are quite similar in terms of their <coughs> nutrients and the nutrient environment for organisms living inside of them, okay? And in fact, there's quite a bit of attention that's paid for very obvious reasons about the link between malnutrition and infectious disease in the human epidemiological literature and medical literature more broadly. Uh, and here, in fact, the focus is on micronutrient deficiencies. Sorry, you're putting your glasses on here. I'm, it's not really intended to read that except this title. <laughs> Um, yeah, the interaction between nutrition and infection. I didn't write this. It's more just sort of invoking this idea that there's actually quite a large literature looking at these links in uh, the medical literature. And in fact, from the other end, there's a lot of recent attention using these very simple, what are called food web modules. So this concept of food web modules, we have fairly uh, straightforward mathematical descriptions of 
for example, a predator, a consumer, and a resource. And what happens as you change that resource, for example, or change predation pressure, what happens to the relative abundance of these different species or elements in the food webs, depending on their connectivity or their feeding relationships. And in fact, this has been, uh, by some pretty, pretty great group of ecological modelers, this has been mapped onto human pathogens. Right, so coming at this uh, understanding of nutrition, and in fact, in this paper, one of their axes here is that's dietary nutrient levels. So from low, whatever it might be, whether it's smoking or calcium or other <laughs> dietary nutrients, low to high, what they're doing is they're varying the nutritional environment and looking at the connectivity and ultimately looking at the um, relationships among the organisms or microbes in a human. Right? So this is trying to map some of the ecological theory back onto humans. So we're thinking about nutrition in each of these settings and trying to bring these concepts together. Okay, but one of the problems, I would argue, with working on humans or vertebrates in general or really any animal <laughs> is there are massive ethical problems with manipulating some of these environments. I can't malnourish a group of randomly selected individuals and see what happens when I randomly choose a subset of them and infect them with malaria, right? There's like that scenario, not okay, right? And that's... <laughs> That's not an acceptable scenario, but what we can do is use some of that underlying mathematical theory to make predictions for what should we see across hosts. For example, grasses, where I can ethically do that. I can put it down, and I can feed it whatever I want, and I can come back later and find it, which is a big problem with a lot of organisms. <laughs> they just aren't there. Um, and I can know whether it lived, it died, and what happened to the progress of infection. So there are a lot of um, components of a grass that would allow me to test some of this theory and see, see where it can map on to other diseases. So the focal pathogen that I've been working on, that's the barley and cereal yellow dwarf viruses, BCYDVs. I'll generally talk about them as the BYDVs. That was their historical name. Um, and in fact, as the viral genera are getting revised, they're all becoming BYDVs again right now, and they'll probably be re-split later, but at the moment, um, most of them are BYDVs. They are multi-host pathogen, so like Lyme disease, uh, many other pathogens of humans, they can infect many different types of hosts, so host species. And in fact, they can infect, as far as we know, pretty much any cereal, any grain, so crops, corn, wheat, barley, rye, whatever's on your plate right now, <laughs> cookies, <laughs> right? So that's what, was <laughs> that's what was used to make most of your food. They can also infect native grasses, non-native grasses, annuals, perennials. Um, but they have variable susceptibility, viremia symptoms um, within any given host species. They're globally distributed, so I can do this work in lots of different locations and generally find this pathogen group. Um, there's another really cool complexity here, which is there are multiple pathogens within this group. And so they can infect and co-infect uh, co a single host with implications for changed virulence and changed transmission. Um, there, it's a persistent infection, so it's only found in the vegetative tissue. That's a fairly significant difference from, for example, a human pathogen, but it's not known to be lost while the organism is not in a seed state. So whenever there's phloem, so tissue, above, uh, above or below ground tissue of the plant. There is no vertical transmission, so it's not transmitted through seeds. It's only transmitted through a vector. It must be vectored. Um, but it tends to reduce survival, growth, and fecundity. So this is an infected plant and an uninfected plant of the same age and species. And you can see that there tends to be yellowing of the leaves, so we have these handy names. It was found in barley. It causes yellowing and makes plants small. Barley yellow dwarf. Uh, and it's an economically important grain disease, which is really handy for me as an ecologist because there's a lot known about it. Um, so I can start to ask questions about this pathogen group in non-crop species. 
Okay, so this is just to show you that we've, we do find a lot of co-infection in the field. So this is a study that we did in, uh, published in 2009. On the y-axis is the number of plants. On the x-axis is the number of virus species within any individual. So we have, you know, a whole lot of plants that are uninfected, but we have a very substantial proportion of plants that have one, two, three, four, or five different viral species within an individual plant. So we do see co-infection. So that led us to think about, for example, change transmission or changed virulence. I'll circle back to that uh, closer to the end of this talk. Um, okay, I need to give you a little background on grasses here because this is a bit of a leap from a single species like human, for example. Um, we have perennial grasses and annual grasses in this system. Perennial grasses can live for up to a century, so that often surprises people. Uh, they, can, they are not known to lose their infection, and so they act as among season reservoirs of infection. Annual grasses, on the other hand, will only retain their vegetative biomass, so translate to can only retain this viral infection for one season. They grow, they set seed, they drop the seed, and that's it. There's no more infection. That infection doesn't persist. So in a world with annual grasses, this viral group wouldn't persist. Uh, but the role within season is to increase. Uh, they tend to be a good host for vectors. They tend to be a good host for the virus. And so they increase the prevalence of infection. OK. So I want to think about scales first, the scales of infection. This is at the large spatial scales, but also phylogenetic scales. So we have infection that requires a lot of different elements to persist. First, we have the regional context. So species ranges need to be overlapping to have infection. You need to have the host in the same place as the pathogen. And if it's vectored, in the same place as the vectors. Whether that's through changing climate, changing distributions, invasive species, there's any number of ways that these ranges can shift through time and bring hosts and pathogens and their vectors into contact or take them away from one another, right? So we could actually also see a reduction in infection prevalence if ranges shift such that they're less overlapping or non-overlapping. Um, this can be driven by any number of things. So this is a map of white nose syndrome. It's a bit old at this point, but this is um, just to show the overlap here of species uh, and the virus and the host species together. Uh, in some cases, these overlap, uh, overlapping ranges can be based on seasonal variation. Uh, in some cases, rainfall abundance, right? Um, but think about this in terms of nutritional environment or regional context for human pathogens, right? We know that human pathogens don't persist everywhere. There are certain ranges where they're present. In some cases, for example, with malaria, that maps quite closely onto rainfall abundance and seasonal patterns. Uh, it's also emerging that it's also in, uh, associated with human nutrition. Okay, local context. This is an example of Lyme disease here. So we have the relative abundance of hosts. Some are very good hosts from the pathogen's perspective. They shed a lot of virus. They're moving a lot of um, pathogen into the environment. Uh, some are bad hosts, like humans, actually. <laughs> We're pretty crummy hosts for Lyme disease. We're kind of a dead end for Lyme disease. Uh, and some are non-hosts, right? So if a tick bites a non-host, the pathogen is done at that point. Uh, local soil fertility or host nutrition can again play in at local scales to alter the dynamics uh, of infection. And then host traits, so this is a phylogenetic lineage of fish and looking at fish uh, gut, path uh, excuse me, uh, gut parasites uh, from a study from 2005. So host traits, which are evolutionarily underpinned, uh, phylogenetic or taxonomic distance can in some cases, for example here, predict the gut community of parasites. Lifespan, pathogen competence, all of these can overlay on host traits. Growth rate or competitive ability. 
and vector preferences. All of these may be in part a function of host, the host traits themselves. So there are many scales at which uh, infection can proceed and may be important and may not be important. But I would say that while these may all be very important for human pathogens, it's very difficult to sort apart, to disarticulate each of these components. But then there are experiments. <laughs> so this is an experiment that we did on the U.S. West Coast. So this is Sacramento down here, San Francisco here, just to get your bearings up to Eugene and Portland here. So it spans seven degrees of latitude. We had three sites here running from uh, coastal, more coastal to more inland sites, which basically gave us a rainfall gradient without having a latitudinal gradient. So we had a change, pretty dramatic change in the rainfall environment. And then up here, fairly high rainfall, similar to some of these sites, um, but a very different uh, season length and other characteristics of the sites. So it's five sites spanning uh, four, excuse me, seven degrees of latitude. At each site, we had plots that were uncharacteristically large for grassland ecology. They were 40 meters on a side, so 1,600 square meters, where we added either nitrogen or phosphorus or both or neither. So a factorial combination of nutrients uh, were added into two blocks at each of these sites. So the idea wasn't to replicate it within site. The idea was to replicate across sites so that we could start to extract some of these regional as well as local effects. Um, I need to step aside here and talk a bit about nutrients. Here we go, Jim. Are you excited? <laughs> um, I know, right? <laughs> OK, well, I had nitrogen and phosphorus on the last slide. So um, the dogma is generally a single nutrient limitation dogma and understanding what might be drivers in this system. But what's really interesting to me, and in fact, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Jim, but um, we added phosphorus in that experiment because, because of a conversation I had with you before we started, um, thinking about what might be the nutrient, if there were a single nutrient limiting these species, what might be the, the nutrient that would be the first to limit? For aphids, the general sense is they're sucking on phloem, which is very carbon rich. It's basically eating sugar, uh, sugars, <laughs> not like table sugar. Um, and so they're getting a lot of carbon relative to the nitrogen that they need to make proteins. So they're generally thought to be nitrogen limited. Um, and some of our data since then has borne that out. Uh, viruses are thought to be phosphorus limited. They're very rapidly proliferating. They um, need a lot of phosphorus to, well, at least at the host scale, to fuel creation of ribosomes, make this machinery to replicate themselves. Okay, so if we add phosphorus, this gives us, and find that phosphorus is important, it suggests in the field experiment that it may actually be something about what's happening at the scale of the virus. Whereas if nitrogen is very important, it may in fact indicate that something about the aphid, that vector, is the really key link here for understanding infection processes. Okay, so that aside for hypotheses, back to some of the design here. Um, this is my diligent field crew, um, the lab manager at the time who almost quit after this experiment because it was really insane um, to try to do this at planting experiment. So planting out um, thousands of individuals across the U.S. West Coast that started as uninfected. This is a phylogeny of the West Coast grasses, and these are our hosts. So we took into account phylogenetic relatedness, and so we had paired annual and perennial species across the phylogeny. So here's Caleria novena, Teneathrum elmus, and Bromus. So three sets of pairs. So we grew these healthy individuals and planted them into the field. Um, sorry if you're red, green, color blind. That was something we had to ask people before they went into the field with us. You can see here in a grassland of all kinds of species, this is how we went back and identified every individual in the field after we'd planted it. So once it was planted into the field, it really became very much like all of the other species around it. It looked alike. And in fact, we saw um, very little difference across the fields. We needed a metal detector to refine our hosts, but they were there. <laughs> mm 
Um, so there are about 5,100 individuals by the end of this study that we assayed for all five of these virus species. Um, I want to note here that we planted them about 15 per plot. Sorry, I should back up. So one individual of each species was planted into a subplot within this larger 40 by 40 meter block uh, along transects. So each of these was an individual species randomized at its location relative to the others, but one of the six was planted in each of these locations then into a subplot here. Um, we allowed them to be sort of exposed to the environment, so aphid arrival, for example, pathogen transmission could happen across about a 75-day period, which is approximately the growing season in that region. Um, so we collected them in May of 2008. So this is what we found. So first off, these are my regions. These two are the Oregon sites and the California sites. So while we see <coughs> Substantial variation in the prevalence of infection, so this is at the scale of the population or community. Prevalence of infection is highly variable from about 10% to nearly 40% across these blocks. We don't see a strong north-south gradient. So there isn't something that's explicitly regional that's happening in these data, right? So there isn't a driver that has to do with being in one location or region relative to another. But what about that local context? We actually see some pretty substantial drivers of infection in the local context. Again, this is prevalence of infection, so an epidemiological type of measure. Prevalence of infection increases with the cover of perennial grasses. Where we have no perennial grasses in a plot, we have very little predictive ability. But as soon as there are perennial grasses in those plots, those reservoir species, we see increasing proportion of infection. And in fact, when we look at each of the virus species within that, so I, I look inside of those data, all of the viral species appear to be doing the same thing. With increasing reservoir, proportion of reservoirs in the community, we see increasing infection prevalence in that community. Okay, but what about nutrients, right? So that nutritional context. When we fertilize with phosphorus, we see a really strong signal <laughs> of prevalence. See, I think this is why I got invited, right? So on the y-axis here <laughs> is the proportion of infection across these field plots, across seven degrees of latitude. We find this very consistent result um, that prevalence of infection is increased when we increase phosphorus supply. Okay, but what happens with each of the viruses that are behind this overall prevalence? So this is really looking from the host perspective. Let's look from the virus perspective. There are really only two viruses that are massively increased, dramatically increased here, uh, in terms of infection. The rest of them are not strongly affected. I'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> on the y-axis here again is prevalence. On the x-axis now is that phylogenetic lineage, so evolutionary history, evolutionary, evolutionary relatedness among hosts. What do we see here? In fact, there's no strong signal of annuals being a better host or certain clades being a better host. In fact, we do see very uh, substantial variation here, but it's really within one group of quite closely related grasses. So when I look at the, what's behind that, now I have viral species on the x-axis. This is uh, the five different virus species, each name for the vector that carries it. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> um, and again, this is prevalence on the y-axis. You can see teniathrum, that one that was very, very high, is always relative high, relatively high compared to Elemis, which is very closely related to it phylogenetically. Right? And so there's a very consistent host signal here, which is that some hosts are simply better for viruses in terms of prevalence and spread than other hosts. OK, so that's a lot. I just want to summarize that piece. So first is 
I would argue that experimentally, it's really great to be able to disarticulate these pieces. It gives us some insights that we can't gain for a lot of other types of species. Um, and in fact, we find that nutrition, it's these very local processes, host nutrition and host local context, proportion of perennial grasses or reservoir species, are really good predictors of infection prevalence in the community. And interestingly, perennial grasses tend to you know, sort of raise all boats. Where there's more perennial grasses, all of the viruses are doing better. Whereas when there's phosphorus added, it's only certain viruses that apparently are responding very strongly, even though they're all very closely related, chemically very similar, very similar requirements of these species. Um, so regional variation in host phylogeny, on the other hand, appear to be not particularly important uh, as, as predictors of infection in the field. Okay. But there's a problem that's always bugged me, and so <laughs> I'll show you what this is. When we fertilize plants in the field, you dump fertilizer on a plot, you don't just change one thing. In fact, when I add nitrogen in a plot, so this is nitrogen added, I get more annuals. Well, those are the species that are better at spreading infection through a season, right? So I'm changing the composition of the community at the same time I'm changing the chemistry of any individual, so the chemical environment for a host. So there's the larger host context, but there's also the individual context from the perspective of a vector uh, and the viruses within the host. Okay, so that makes it really complicated to understand uh, what are the different drivers here. So what we decided to do is bring this into the, oh, wait. Got ahead of myself. There other, the other problem with the field work that we had done is that we had not been able to sort apart uh, whether it was nutrient supply rate or nutrient supply ratio that was determining these patterns. And so this is one study that we did that suggested that supply ratio was very important. So this is with nitrogen added alone along here. Where nitrogen is added at zero to very, very high rates of nitrogen, uh, prevalence of infection is pretty constant when you don't add phosphorus. When phosphorus is added with no nitrogen, you get this massive increase in prevalence. So infection across that, small, that local community. But as this ratio declines to one to one, you see a decline back to no difference from nitrogen added. So it suggests that there's maybe something about the ratio of nutrients that may be driving what we were seeing in the field, and it may not simply be the rate of supply. Okay, so that's really complicated. We decided to bring it back into the lab so that we could look at just one component, the host chemistry piece of this. In the absence of the rest of community change, we wanted to understand from the virus perspective what was going on within the host in terms of the nutritional environment. And so this is work that was led by a postdoc of mine, Christelle Lacroix, who has gone off and gotten a job at INRA in France. So uh, this work will continue to come out through time, but <laughs> we'll see the rate. Um, what she did was she took two viruses um, that were vectored by the same species, the same vector species. A single host, this is a crop plant, she used a vena. And she had nutrient environments that we decided should be stoichiometrically balanced, such that N and P added together was the same ratio, but a different rate than our control or low. Right? So we have low N, low P, and high N, high P at the same ratio, but very different rates. And then these N and P's match the high rate, and the other part <laughs> matches the low here. And so what she did was she tracked infection. She infected the hosts, and at 19 days post-inoculation, looked at infection. So looked at the success of infection of a single virus and two viruses together in a host. 
Okay, so this is a bit of a complicated figure, so I'm going to take you through piecewise. On the x-axis here are single inoculations, so when a host under a particular nutrient environment has a single virus that's introduced into it, on the y-axis is when that host under a particular nutrient environment has both uh, viruses introduced. What is the success of inoculation? Okay, so down here indicates that uh, there's suppression by co-infection under a particular nutrient regime, and up here means there's enhancement of co-infection, right? Okay. That's where our controls lie. So you can see that both of them, under low nutrients, both of these virus species are somewhat suppressed by co-infection. All right, what happens when we add nutrients? Do we increase that environment? Do we uh, allow more co-infection? Well, yeah, we actually do. We see that from these controls, for PAV in particular, we see a pretty substantial increase in the success of co-infection. So PAV can uh, infect more hosts than RPV with these elevated nutrients. But RPV is really increased in particular with nitrogen added. All right. But I'm showing you these as the rates, not the ratios. If we look at the ratios, where my control and my NP are the same in terms of ratio, this is what it looks like. So we get a somewhat different story here, which is pretty interesting. We see that there's very little effect of the ratio on infection or co-infection success for PAV. But RPV, wow, look at that. <laughs> We have a really different result for RPV. In fact, this very similar, very, very closely related virus uh, seems to decline in terms of its ability to infect a host at all through this, uh, through this experiment with phosphorus added. OK, so again, just a summary there so that we can catch up with the last piece. The N to B supply ratio is altering infection, but it's not really altering co-infection, so coexistence from putting on my community ecology hat. And these really similar viruses can really differ in their responses to nutrients, which is very surprising to us. Um, and I, I don't have great answers to that, but you can ask anyway. Um, Nitrogen addition tends to increase inoculation and co-inoculation success for both of these viruses, whereas phosphorus, it really differs. But it seems to be completely counter to what we found in the field. It seems to either have a neutral or suppressive effect on the ability of viruses to infect hosts. All right, so then I'm left with this one. Like, so why is that? Right? So why is nitrogen more important in the lab and phosphorus seems to matter in the field? And I spent a long time uh, scratching my head over this and trying to think about you know, what would be the next study to do. Concurrently, I have a graduate student who's working on nutrient supply and trying to map the pre presence and ability of uh, viruses to coexist or co-infect a host onto nutrient supply ratios. And so what she's doing is trying to test coexistence theory and understand where it breaks when we look at organisms that are not free-living organisms. So she used the same design, generally, that Christelle did. This is Amy Kendig. Uh, she used the same design here, but she tracked virus titer through time. Remember with Christelle's results, she was looking at 19 days post-inoculation. The assumption that we've always had, based on all of the literature and crops looking at the same group of viruses, is that titer increases and then levels out and is at a constant equilibrium after that through time. Okay, so I had been operating on this assumption of an equilibrium system. Amy was doing experiments to figure out at what point in time does the system reach that equilibrium value such that she could do mutual invasibility trials. OK, that's great, except that she sent me these data last Friday. All right, I know that's messy, and it's not really prime time as a, a graph, but what I'll do is I'll show you what I saw. <laughs> All right, so there's phosphorus, right? Phosphorus is causing this early peak here. That's the phosphorus added treatment. All right, but then there's the NP treatment. Wait, 
The peak is later, the slope is shallower. That's really interesting. Oh, then there's nitrogen. It kind of stinks, <laughs> right? It's sort of low, tighter, and it kind of is slowly making its way up to maybe an equilibrium, maybe a peak that'll decline later when we get data out here. Uh, and then there's the control. OK, so I'm going to get rid of messy data, because I'm <laughs> sort of stressed by that, right? And I'm building my house of cards here, but I actually think that there's this is a really interesting direction to head, is we've always assumed that titer came to some equilibrium, and that's generally what's thought in the literature. This suggests that, that is probably not what's going on. And in fact, we have this rapid growth <laughs> with phosphorus added in excess, but then a rapid peak and decline, right? So the thought is that this decline may be associated with gene silencing in the host, um, but it's also possible that this has to do with the relative rates of supply of nutrients to the virus or host itself, um, such that, you know, the host can't really respond when they're starving, so they have these infections that persist. But with phosphorus, maybe the virus takes off really quickly, but the host is able su to suppress it more quickly. Okay, so what this suggests to me is that if I look at 10 days post-inoculation, I have this beautiful stoichiometric story where I add phosphorus and I have a lot more infection. I add NP and control, right? They're at the same ratios. Isn't that beautiful? And then I add N alone and I get this very, you know, lowest titer. This completely maps on to the growth rate hypothesis and all of the implications associated with that for infection moving through a community because titer is a very good predictor of transmission. All right, but wait, <laughs> it's not equilibrium. What if I look at day 25 or 20? I find an entirely different story here where titer is highest in my control plants, where I have the lowest nutrient supply and it's lowest in my phosphorus added plants. But if I only sample here, which is what we may have been doing, for example, in Christel's experiment, where we looked at about 19 days post-inoculation, that may be why we're not finding a strong effect of phosphorus. Or in fact, it's suppressive in terms of its effects. And so this has caused me in the past, you know, like <laughs> 72 hours to rethink about eight years of work that we've been doing. Um, but I think that there's something really exciting here if you'll go with me and accept that um, my lines are drawn onto something. Amy probably is having a heart attack right now thinking that she's only halfway through this experiment and she has yet to get the rest of her, um, her replicates analyzed. But, but still, when I look back at the original papers, that talk about this equilibrium value, that's not what they find. I, I found myself looking at this and then going, but wait, we've always thought, and looking back at these papers, and in fact, there is a decline. It's just not talked about. And so I think there's quite a bit here um, that we could move forward with. And so mapping on, this is uh, ecological theory for free living organisms, looking at succession under different nutrient environments. So this is succession, different species indicated by these different lines. Um, different species come to dominate systems under different nutrient conditions, but the trajectories of change are also very different. If we map that onto some of this theory that I talked about at the very beginning, I think that we could go somewhere pretty exciting in terms of understanding and potentially predicting uh, the composition of these communities through time and recognizing that they're very likely not to be equilibrium communities. Okay, so here's where I'd like to leave you is that experiments, I think, can disentangle some of these elements that are very difficult to disentangle for other species, particularly humans, but also vertebrates in general that the composition of hosts and the relative abundance of non-hosts can really alter infection. That's maybe not a new statement, but it's a new insight into that statement in terms of transmission. Uh, nutrient supply and host composition, uh, excuse me, host quality and quantity uh, can really uh, be altered by nutrient supply, but within hosts, nutrient supply can also alter this time course of infection. So if we think about for example, malnutrition and infection, 
this may be a new way to think about that relationship as this non-equilibrium relationship. And it has implications for within host microbial comp competition. So the likelihood that they would even interact with each other at all within a host through time. Uh, transmission properties really depend on infection or co-infection. And then virulence itself. So here's where we're headed is understanding the role of host nutrition in a variety of different ways. Um, successful infection uh, for a single virus entering an already infected host. How is that altered by the nutritional environment of that host, the host nutrition? Uh, virus titer transmission and virulence with implications for evolution of virulence with one or two viruses present may be modified under different nutrient, uh, nu nutritional scenarios. Um, host growth rate may also be modified by, for example, the relative supply of phosphorus and nitrogen. And we're just now getting some of these data from Amy's work and Christelle's work looking at host growth rate and modeling that trajectory of host growth. Uh, and we'll be able to map virus titer back onto that to look at the relationship between host growth rate and virus titer. Uh, and then whether or not another virus is present. And then in a different study, and this is where a nutrient network comes into this, that we're doing at about 80 sites on, uh, in 20 countries on, I don't know, about six continents. We're doing a replicated experiment where we're adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and then potassium and micronutrients in a factorial com uh, combination, and we're planting hosts of genetically identical hosts, so maize, out into these plots to look at the microbial community first, what determines that microbial community, and second, we'll bring a subset of those into the lab to then challenge them with pathogens and look at what, what about that nutrition determines the microbial community and how does that play out functionally for the plant in terms of its microbial community determining uh, the success of infection. And this maps quite closely onto some of the work being done with the Human Microbiome Project. So we're using some of the same techniques. So I need to thank collaborators in particular, Amy Kendig and Christelle Lacroix. Uh, Eric Seabloom's been involved in all of these. Uh, Parviz, Charles, and Sunny have all been involved in those early studies. Uh, that I talked about, so thank you. Thanks, Liz, that was terrific. So we have time for uh, questions, unless you feel them. Yeah. Very interesting, thanks so much for yeah, sure. that's about your work. Um, my question is about um, like the street theory and whether it might be relevant to mm -hmm. the sort of different use of nutrients and the sort of different scales that you see of the increases in Viral yeah, tell me what you mean. So the life history in terms of the host or the virus, the virus or the actually, <laughs> aphid. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, yeah. the virus is using different life history strategies in the presence of different limiting nutrients. Yeah, that's a great question. And again, that one's open um, at the moment. We haven't tackled that um, in terms of... The viruses themselves, they're so closely related. They're so similar biochemically. Um, structurally that s some of these results are like, they were super surprising to us and you, you may have noticed they were published in 2014, like this is relatively new stuff um, in terms of thinking about, wow, what might lead to such significant differences between these viruses and I think maybe some of the titer itself, but I don't know, I hadn't really thought about how life history might vary between these viruses since they're so, excuse me, so closely related, but yeah, it's a cool idea to think about that. Yeah. We know much about the antiviral processes in the grass. Yeah, so, so the exactly. So that's actually a great question um, that I've started to think about in about the past 72 hours since I got these data from Amy. Um, yes, yeah, so there is, there are a couple, from the virus perspective, there are a couple things that might lead, a, lead to the slowing, but from the host perspective, um, there's uh, post post-transcriptional gene silencing that it has as one of its few antimicrobial uh, sort of um, strategies. So grasses are fairly simple. They don't have some of the chemical defenses and other defenses. They have structural and then the sort of post-transcriptional gene silencing and they don't really have a, a much larger 
basket of goods to um, bring to bear against viruses. So that's about what's interesting, and this is something that I started to talk to Yang Kuang and Bruce Pell about um, from the modeling end, is it, it's possible that that could, you know, there's some tighter level that turns that on for the host, right? So that may be reached more quickly under phosphorus conditions because the virus itself is increasing. But it may be from the host perspective, it may um, be upregulated more rapidly under phosphorus conditions. And that's something that I think will take theory to disarticulate. I'm not certain how we would do that empirically because they're so tightly related. But yeah. Maybe. I mean, I suppose if we could figure out a way to knock that out, um, that would be the way to do it. Um, it there's like, maybe in barley because the whole genome is known, but grasses don't have the same history as Arabidopsis, for example, <laughs> um, in terms of being able to turn bits on and off. <laughs> I can't order my mouse, you know. <laughs> I know, right? Well, wait, but it's not a grass. All right. <laughs> I've got it in my ditches in Nutri Network. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we have those data. Um, Christelle has collected those. There's not a huge effect, but we also haven't really dug in. So that's the next phase. The other thing that Christelle did, along with collecting a lot of the responses of the plants, photosynthesis, uh, specific leaf area, um, a mass above ground, below ground. She collected through time growth rate, um, so length of the longest leaf. Um, but she also, uh, did a second inoculation. So from these plants on day 28, I think, she then put aphids onto them and transmitted whatever was there onto an uninfected host. So there, we have a lot more to play with here. Based on Amy's data, I, would, I expect that actually the phosphorus will be the lowest transmission. But back to your question about um, photosynthesis, I don't know the answer yet, but we have the data. So we're getting there. <laughs> I was going to yeah. turn the question around. Are your transformed uh, plants, what's their viral sensitivity? Yeah, what do you have? <laughs> what you got? <laughs> what, what is, my question is the infection is through the floor suction. Mm -hmm. This way it's inoculated. No, the, the virus originally is inoculated in the floor. Yeah, it's in the phloem and it stays in the phloem. Yeah, so it's restricted to phloem. So but it goes systemic, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, that's actually a really cool idea. I don't know in the lab if we have a broad enough set of conditions to really capture that, but we could create that in a you know, subsequent experiment. We could create a range of you know, spatter. Size, size is very similar. Yeah, in fact, we didn't really expect to see big differences. Yeah, yeah, I would love to chat with you more about that, actually. Yeah. You had, yeah. I, I don't work on pathogens, so with that caveat. <laughs> I've been learning more about it with all these biomarkers talks we've had, and I was told that in animals, it's rare to be infected by more than one virus mm -hmm. in non-immunocompromised mm -hmm. individuals. Mm -hmm. Assuming that's true, our grasses, it's amazing to have five infections, right. not an insubstantial form. Right, is exactly. That, is that common for other, not just this group of viruses, but for other kinds? I don't know across other plant species. I mean, if you're really focused on these, these two crops. Um, but in terms of co-infection, that's a lot more common than we think. Mm -hmm. So I would say I... I don't know that I would agree that any single host is not, especially with all of the work that's emerging with the Human Microbiome Project. We are finding that we have so many, we don't even, we're mostly microbe, right? So we not only have lots and lots and lots of species of bacteria, but we also have fungi and viruses that are just kind of hanging. <laughs> you know, like we don't know what their function is, but they're there. And so I guess in terms of, if you're thinking about co-infection by closely related species, that often happens, or where that um, 
where that happens is when there's not synergistic mortality. There can be synergistic mortality in hosts such that closely related viruses can lead to enhanced symptoms and death <laughs> um, of a host. And so you wouldn't see co-infection, not because it doesn't happen, but because it takes, yeah, exactly, it takes that host out of the system. So there's a whole range of different reasons that you wouldn't see co-infection, but I would argue that it's more common than we've generally documented. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a cool question. All right, we've come to the end of our right. hour, and Liz is hungry. Thanks. And he says, <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's give her a great hand for a moment.